So, hello everyone. Uh, I think we are live. We are uh, global. And this week I'm uh, very happy that we have uh, um, uh, Dr. Robert Shapiro, actually, he was a professor. He's now at Microsoft. He was before professor at uh, Princeton University. And here, actually, he got several awards. He can talk about them, it's like uh, ACM dissertation awards, uh, as well as Godel and uh, Kanalakis award. And we are talking about machine learning. So that's one of the things that we talk about it. Uh, please feel free to ask uh, questions. You can ask uh, questions at YouTube chat or at LinkedIn, these are the best. Uh, also at Twitter, I believe you can do that. I try to check and if there are some good questions, I will ask. Uh, so uh, by this introduction, uh, so let's uh, go <laughs> to Rob. We want to start to say something and then we can talk about questions and other stuff. Oh, do I have anything to say? Well, all I have to say is thank you for inviting me. <laughs> yeah, uh, so I here. think it's great to have you here. And uh, like, uh, good. So I think uh, we generally, I mean, there's no particular order that we are asking questions. We may go back and forth to make it uh, every time something for general audience, sometimes for more researchers in the field, talk about open problems, etc. And some other aspects of life, like industry versus academia, especially you are a good person to ask this question uh, because you had experience at both of them. Uh, great. So, uh, like the first question I always ask is <laughs> Have you been thinking that you want to be a computer scientist or scientist in general? Have you been good at math? And did you try to participate in any math competition and others? Yeah. Oh, you mean when I was when I was little? Yeah. <laughs> when I was, um, yeah, I think I well, I I think I really started loving math um, around middle school and into high school. And yes, I loved math for a long time and computer science. I mean, there wasn't I, there was not so much computer science when I was in high school. Um, so um, by my first. You know, there, it's not like today, obviously, where there are computers everywhere, including every single person's pocket. And um, so, uh, my my first time using a computer, my we I grew up in Albany, New York, or near Albany, and my the only person they knew who knew anything about computers was in Stony Brook on Long Island, and so they sent me on a bus to visit that person so that I could. <laughs> Get my first exposure to computers by traveling on a bus to get there. And, and which um, year was that? Um, that was would have been about 1980, about maybe 79, somewhere in there. Uh, and, so, uh, was there a punch card at that time, or was there a um, Well, there were. You could you could program on a computer. There were just. Uh, uh, these small computers, I, I I guess they would have been called personal computers at that point that you could get. They had a Commodore PET, for if there are any old timers in the yeah, actually, <laughs> audience. Got... And then later Apples came in, came out. But... Yeah, uh, I was born actually in 1979. So this, <laughs> I had that time, <laughs> I, think I, did. I don't remember the yeah. memory of that time, uh, surely. Uh, uh, good, and uh, so, uh, and so have you uh, have you written like a computer program so like uh, even now go from in high school or after that at uh, a university uh, where was your bachelor i i went to brown but yeah so university. after after that experience then then my school had a uh, had they didn't have a computer but they had a terminal that would dial in to um a mainframe computer yes. somewhere that you know over these 300 baud lines you know like not not 300 meg or 300 gig or 300 just total baud <laughs> yeah uh, to I, 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 I just, actually 
uh, those type this floppy disk that we needed to use it essentially oh, yeah. <laughs> and just like 100 like one megabyte i think they had their space 1.44 or something like this this bigger one oh, those were the 1. bigger 1. ones yeah yeah but but yeah. yeah i really fell in love and so i started hanging out and around that terminal and writing computer programs and yeah i loved it uh, so at and brown then, it was it the cs department yeah yeah it was cs by then mm -hmm. so you went there and, uh, and so then after that uh, you went to mit to get your phd there mm -hmm. right and it, so that was actually quick... actually just actually at yeah, brown i did at brown i did math and computer science with a combined degree but yes and then i went to mit for computer science uh, yeah, and then I think uh, there you were advised by uh, Ron Rivers. He actually got a Turing Award. And actually, I'm very proud yeah. because I have a, I mean, the paper actually co-authored with him. So it was always interesting oh. for me that, uh, I mean, uh, like uh, Ron generally works more on the uh, like crypto stuff uh, or like the uh, yeah security stuff and others. But uh, both you and Abim were He's a student, and I think around the same time as well. And you are both, I mean, great. Uh, I mean, two of the best people that I know that bringing essentially uh, like theory into machine learning. So how was uh, the story there? I mean, was yeah. he actively well, working on that or? Yeah, so, um, so yes, Ron Rivest is known for cryptography. You know, he's best known for RSA cryptos crypto schemes, um, which happened before I arrived at MIT. And um, about the time I arrived, he was getting interested in machine learning. So Les Valiant had published this paper, um, a theory of the learnable, that was a really big deal in the theory community and got people like Ron, who were theoretical computer scientists interested in machine learning. It really started the field of what came to be called computational learning theory. And so during the time we were there, that was pretty much the main thing that he was working on in terms of research. I mean, he had he had a lot going on all the time, but in terms of research. And so there were several students of his at that time. There was me and Avram and um, Bob Sloan and Bona Singh and um, others. Michael Kearns was a postdoc there. And um, and then sometime after that, he moved on to back to crypto and voting and all kinds exactly. of other stuff. But for a time, that was really what he was doing. So it was, yeah, a, it was a great time. It was a lot of fun. Uh, yeah, I think the work that we had, it was about the security of voting, essentially, and voting game. So, But yeah, so that was interesting that uh, I think for a period of time, actually, he was working on the, he was interested in learning and he had like the, Great people <laughs> like you and Avrim and others that graduated actually from his group. Uh, uh, good. So now, uh, before do, uh, going to I mean more deeper in your thesis, etc. But uh, like uh, you want to say a little bit about your family. I mean, how many children you have? What do they do? Are they interested in computer science? <laughs> we try to actually uh, um, go to computer science or not? Is that interesting question that we ask from? So yeah, people, yeah. Well, um, no, neither of them are. I, okay. I have two children. I have a, uh, my oldest is my daughter, Jennifer, Jenny. Um, and, uh, she's, well, she's living in Nashville now. She's, a she's creating beautiful music down there. That's what people do in Nashville. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, but now she's planning to, um, change paths and she's actually planning to go back to school to become a midwife so that's exciting news for us that she's going to do that um and my son zachary graduated from brown also my daughter went to oberlin my son went to brown he graduated about a year and a half ago so he's he majored in chemistry um but he's now working as a research assistant at Rockefeller University in New York. He's doing developmental neuroscience, very cool stuff with taking stem cells and growing all kinds of things out of them. It's really cool stuff he's doing. So they're both pretty amazing. 
Uh, yeah, so uh, did you try to affect to mention, I mean, like, for example, chemistry versus computer science? Oh, yeah, so did I try to? Um, <laughs> yeah, well, my goal was to get them um, to just take a single computer science class. And unfortunately, I did not succeed at that with either one. <laughs> but it's okay. They're, they, both, they both follow their own hearts. And uh, what about your parents? Did they... Any of them were scientists or professors or others? Well, my, my father was a psychiatrist. Uh, good. My mother uh, was, was not. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, I didn't mention my wife. My wife is a, um, she's a clinical social worker. She has a therapy practice here in Princeton. So, but yeah, not, well, yeah. I mean, psychiatry is a field of medicine. So that's a kind of science. Yeah, and what my son that, does is science, and now my daughter is heading for a healthcare profession. So, I think like a healthcare medicine is like computer science. I think these are the, yeah. it's like a good mix, actually. So, I think you are uh, doing different things, and uh, that's great that you are enjoying all of that. Uh, good. So, I think uh, now uh, having a uh, uh, talk about the family, etc. So, I, I think now uh, let's go to. I mean, the time that you were at uh, MIT, unless you want to add anything about the time at Brown. So uh, like at uh, MIT, I think uh, you were with Ron. So how was the group? So uh, and, like, what was the way that, I mean, you liked something about advice, uh, like uh, the way that uh, Ron was advising or something that you especially liked and the others can do that. Uh, that's, yeah, you want to say something about that? Oh, well, um... He was a fantastic advisor. And um, I mean, the first thing he did that was very nice was to let me into his group, which was <laughs> really nice because when I arrived at MIT, I was very lost and had no group and no office. And I was lonely and depressed <laughs> looking for an advisor and a research direction. And um, so, um, yeah, and he was always very generous with his time and he just taught me everything I know about research um he really taught me how to do research you know how to how to find good problems to work on strategies for attacking them how to publish how to write a paper all the all those things so I would... yeah that's actually I mean the people I mean I have been at my <laughs> so it's a bit I mean scary sometimes you will come because I think like it would be hard to join to some groups. You need to show yourself essentially. So that's actually important that you will join a strong group and one person accept you as a, um, like a, 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 as an advisee. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, yeah, and that was actually interesting. Like the time that I was at uh, MIT, I didn't actually, maybe I, of course I met Ron but they maybe talk a little bit. But this paper that we had, it actually happened, I think, like back in 2018 or something like this. I gave a talk actually at Berkeley and he was visiting Berkeley and he came to that talk and then mentioned something. And then this was actually a paper with Avrim as well. So I think that was a good paper to have Avrim and <laughs> running the same paper. But uh, uh, good. And mm -hmm. so uh, this was actually interesting that also, I mean, you had a great thesis that won ACM doctoral dissertation award. So do you want to talk a little bit about the thesis concept and whether still you are doing the same thing or this thing that you are doing now is completely different from the thing that you have done? Well, was my, my thesis ended up having multiple parts in it. Um, so um, when, when I first started working with Ron, what he was really interested in was learning um, he called it the critter problem. So imagine that there's a critter in some kind of world and um, you know the critter has certain actions it can take and then it there was no notion of reward, but when it took an action, it could it got some stuff happened. like um, you know, maybe a light goes on or a light goes off or you know the color of the wall seems to change or you know whatever. actions have effects on what it's seeing. And so the idea was to try to reconstruct the structure of that world from the from experimenting with it. And the simplest case is where the world is finite size. And so then it becomes the problem of 
learning a finite automaton. And so I spent a lot of time working on that problem, how to learn finite automata, which at the time was a really big problem. Now people hardly even, people working in machine learning hardly even are aware of this huge body of work that was done then on learning finite automata. But so a part of it was algorithms for learning finite automata. I did more and, like a Markov chain type of thing, correct? That is... Um, uh, well, it's like Markov chain, but they're actions. So, so the but actions, yeah. So that those, so it is more like the basic stuff, essentially, or basis of uh, bandit problems. Um, or reinforcement well, learning in general. It's I definitely say. related to reinforcement learning, but in reinforcement learning, you have a reward, and it's less about discovering structure and more about discovering how to maximize some kind of reward. This was about how do I learn learn the structure of this world by experimenting with it and more so it's definitely results. related definitely related but a little bit different uh, reinforcement learning was still was around then also and you know people like rich rich sutton and and that's obviously grown and become a huge field but uh, and what about deep learning was it there at that time as well well it wasn't called deep learning but there was definitely neural network learning. <laughs> and, there yeah. uh, that was that was like the first wave. I think it was the first wave. So it was also the, a lot of work on neural nets, and then neural nets kind of died down and went out of fashion for many years. And now, obviously, it's come back. Yeah, in <laughs> lots of uh, areas. I think that was because of this. I think uh, this kind of NLP applications that later came back around 2007, eight or something again, resurrected. Yeah, yeah, NLP also vision, yeah. A number yeah. of things, yeah. Yeah, I think the first NLP, I think that vision came at the same time almost. Uh, great. So uh, I think uh, that's it. Do you want to talk, uh, like uh, you were talking about efficient learning algorithm. So which part, uh, like which part you were more excited about? I mean, the result that you had in your thesis and oh. some of them that you may continue as well. Oh, yeah. So the finite automata was one part of the thesis, but another part was on boosting. So did, should we talk about boosting? Uh, yeah, yeah. So, so, uh, yeah, we will talk about, do you want to talk about other parts? Then we go the... Well, the, um, I mean, that I think that's enough of a sampling to talk about. about I'm that. not sure I could remember the other parts. I think there were four, but I mainly remember those two. Or maybe uh, there were five. I think, yeah, these are like the two, uh, I mean, like somehow yeah. things that I continued actually, and you are working on them. So like some versions of them later. So I think, uh, yeah, let's go with uh, other boost. So that's like the, I mean, the boosting algorithm. So maybe you want to talk a little bit uh, about, about this. I think this uh, other boost is somehow is the father of some other uh, gradient boosting algorithm, like the one that currently the people are using it. Uh, XG boost, for example, or a light GBM. These are the more modern version of that, essentially, or the faster version of them. I have been at industry and the people are using this all the time. Neural nets, I mean, they use it for some NLP or I don't know, vision or something. But for general, if you want to do pricing, if you want to some, get some general things, that actually, these are the algorithms that the people are using a lot in practice. They are very fast. They work actually great. I use them a lot, actually, myself, and I have written a mm -hmm. for them. But uh, yeah, so you want to talk about a little bit the, this idea of uh, Adobe Boost, weak learner versus, I mean, like strong learner in some sense and the gradient boosting and yeah, go ahead. Okay, well, <laughs> maybe I should <clears throat> start at the beginning. Um, so one of the basic learning problems, the most basic problem is to learn to classify things. So like you want to classify images as being a picture of a face or not a face, or you want to classify an email message as being spam or not spam. Those are kind of the classic problems. So typically what you do is you get um, a big batch of data, and then the learning algorithm you know, tries to come up with some kind of prediction rule that it outputs, and that can be used to classify new email messages, say, as spam or not spam. So that's the basic problem. And so, um, you know, so if you think about that spam problem, like um, if, if you imagine just on your own trying to come up with a prediction rule that's gonna be very accurate for 
for classifying email as spam or not spam, it's probably pretty hard to do something that's really accurate. But coming up with a rule that's just pretty good, that seems a lot easier. Like a rule, you know, what's a word that people use in spam email messages? Um, you know, I don't know. Do they still send out spam emails with Viagra or something? So if it has the word Viagra in it, then it's then predict it's spam. Otherwise, predict it's not spam. Yeah, I think the most recent one that I got it actually, this happened for, for the chair of or the department. It sends out, okay, I need something. Can you buy these uh, things for me and send it to me? Or can you just uh, give me your phone number such that I can okay. actually co contact you? I actually forwarded this to the chair of the department. I said, oh, these are the, these are, I think, the usual oh, those are like spam fishing. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, one other question. So all of these are in the area of supervised learning we are talking about. Yeah, this is supervised learning, where where somebody has to go through and label the data, and then the learning algorithm learns learns to make predictions from that labeled data. So anyway, so the idea is that you could imagine that coming up with these kind of rough prediction rules that are just pretty good would be a lot easier than coming up with a very, very accurate rule. So then the question is, well, if I can consistently, or if, rather if the learning algorithm can consistently come up with these rough rules, these pretty good rules, can you somehow use them to come up with a single prediction rule that's very, very accurate? And like you can you can really take this to the extreme. So you can, you know, if, if, if I were just guessing at random if an email is spam or not spam, if I literally flip a coin, I'll be right 50% of the time. So the idea is to say, well, what if we can do just a little bit better than random guessing? What if we can do accuracy like 51%, which is barely better than random? Can we use those rules to come up with a single rule that's like 99% accurate? So it turns out that the answer is yes. So this, this was an open problem that was posed when I was in graduate school by Michael Kearns and Les Valiant. And um, so actually it became part of my thesis, the first boosting algorithm for taking these weak rules and converting them into a very highly accurate rule. It turns out that it's always possible. And this is called boosting when you do that. So the boost, first boosting algorithm was in my thesis. It was this more, more complicated algorithm than the one that, ones that people are more familiar with now. And then a few years later, Yoav Roin came up with this much better algorithm called Boost by Majority. And then a few years after that, he and I together came up with an algorithm called AdBoost, which was really the first practical boosting algorithm. And yeah, uh, he, yeah go ahead. Uh, yeah, so I think uh, just, I think, uh, of course, this AdBoost actually got uh, several I mean, uh, awards, like especially a uh, kind of uh, KISS award because of its like uplightness in some sense very mm -hmm. applied and as well as I mean the Google price for that but uh, like can you give one example of like a weak learner like weak learner rules that you can put it for example um well some application okay there? like in like in the email example you literally could search for words you know it could it could just be a word it could be like if this word occurs in the document then predict that it's spam otherwise predict not. it's not spam um, envision, um, you know, right? The 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 um, the first uh, the first really good algorithm for finding faces in a photograph be before deep learning um, was doing it was based on this idea of boosting, and for that they used these very simple rules that would look for just a you know, like a light rectangle over a dark rectangle, for instance. Like if you look at a person's face, for instance, usually, um, usually there, there's you have like bright parts over a dark part where the eyes are, and um, so you can turn that into a weak rule. So if you find like this dark rectangle over a white rectangle, then predict it's a face. Otherwise, predict it's not a face. That's gonna, you know, that's gonna be a terrible rule in general for finding faces but it's better than random guessing. It is better than random guessing. And then, you know, on later 
rounds or iterations of the algorithm, you'll find different rules that have a similar flavor. Um, so, uh, the, and then the question is that uh, I think uh, to get this kind of the like the better rule, like or a strong learner, uh, mm -hmm. how many weak rules do you need to have it? So that's like I think you should have several uh, big learners such that you can get something. Yeah, well, it depends. You know, it depends how good they are, but people I think would typically use like a hundred or a thousand. Yeah, yeah. Well, and and get... also you you also don't have to use weak rules. You can take you can just take any learning algorithm that you already have and use it to produce these weak rules. And then you can use boosting to improve it. So that was a lot of people did that. So a very common algorithm around that time was based on decision trees. And decision trees turn out to be really good weak, weak rules. But then you combine it with boosting and you get really good accuracy. So for for Quite in quite a while, that was one of the best learning algorithms around. Uh, good. So uh, now I do want to maybe go a little bit, maybe deeper into other boost and I mean. So uh, uh, did you use uh, what's the original version? Uh, in the original version, did you use decision trees of like some weak learners, or you were talking more generally about any weak? Uh, well, the the theory is for anything. So the theory is, you know, it's really like a meta algorithm. So you start out with a algorithm that you already have for finding the weak rules and then you apply boosting or specifically add a boost on top of it and it produces you know it it automatically generates calls to this weak learning algorithm that you're starting with and takes the rules that are output by that weak algorithm and combines them into the single rule so it's like it's like a meta algorithm that's built on top of these. And so, you know, in our experiment, well, first of all, it took us a long time to do experiments because we, we were such theoreticians that, you know, <laughs> it's just like, well, we have the theory, what do we need to do experiments for? But eventually we got around to doing experiments and other people did also. And um, so those were usually the types of things I was saying, like these very, very simple rules or decision trees. And a few people were doing a few people were doing boosting on neural nets. Like for for a while, boosting on neural nets was one of the best things for like optical character recognition. Uh, uh, great. So uh, that's uh, so. Uh, uh, how do you uh, turn? I mean, any algorithm into some this kind of any learning algorithm to weak rules? Can you explain a little bit? Oh, well, any learning algorithm just takes, you know, by a learning algorithm, I mean like this subroutine, this algorithm that takes as input a batch of examples and outputs a prediction rule. Yes. So the input is a batch of labeled examples, the output is a prediction rule. And that's all that I mean by a weak learning algorithm. Also, <laughs> a weak learning algorithm is the same thing. It takes a batch of examples and it outputs a prediction rule. It's just how we're thinking about it, that we're thinking about it as producing rules that are pretty crummy, better than random, but pretty crummy, and we want to improve them. And so that's all boosting needs. So boosting automatically creates batches of examples to give to the weak learning algorithm, and then takes those rules output by the weak learning algorithm and combines them into that final combined rule. Yeah. So in some sense, I mean, so you have just one algorithm, but you just give different batches to that. Right. But by each batch, you get essentially some rules. And then exactly. you combine them later, essentially, to get the whole things. Uh, exactly. Out of that. Uh, great. Yeah. So I think I'm asking questions, I think, for me and hopefully for audience. Mm -hmm. I mean, that would be. But uh, uh, yeah, thanks for the explanation. So uh, like, uh, I think one question, uh, like, uh, like you want to talk about more about the gradient, uh, like boosting algorithms, or like uh, that has been used like in XGBoost or LightGBM in general as well. Well, um, okay, I'm I'm not I'm not as intimately familiar with those packages as I probably should be. But the idea of gradient boosting in general came around later. Um, people like Jerry Friedman, especially. So, so what happened in terms of the history was um, at some point, uh, 
some statisticians became interested in boosting. So Leo Bryman was really the first. Um, and then people like uh, Jerry Friedman and um, Tip Sharani and, um, and um, Trevor Hasty um, became very interested in, in boosting. And um, so what people realized, what they especially realized is that you could view boosting as minimizing an objective function, minimizing a loss function. So this is, this is kind of an old idea in statistics and machine learning that if you wanna, if you have data and you want to learn a prediction rule for that data, what you do is you come up with a way of measuring the distance, the discrepancy between the predictions of that rule and the labels on the data itself. So you're like measuring how well you're fitting the data. And then once you have that way of measuring how, how good a fit you have to the data, then you can, then you have a function that you can just minimize. I mean, this and is the same idea. Function. Yeah, it's a loss function. So it's the same idea in neural nets. It's the same idea in linear regression and you know logistic regression. The list goes on and on. So it I turns think it's out, an optimization problem in some yes, sense. Yes, it becomes an optimization the obvious, problem. obvious op optimization problem that you may consider for this. Yeah. Right. And so without a boost, that was less obvious that there's an optimization problem there. But, well, but Leo Bryman realized that without a boost specifically, it turns out that there is this kind of hidden objective function, which is being minimized. It's called the exponential loss that hadn't really been used very much. And we didn't have it in mind when we designed the algorithm, but he realized that in terms of what the algorithm is doing numerically is it's actually minimizing the subjective function. And then, then when, you, when you do that, once you realize that there's this objective function being minimized, then you can kind of take the algorithm and separate it into two parts. You've got the objective function that you're trying to optimize, and you have the numerical algorithm, which is doing the optimization on that function. You have the what is being minimized and how you are minimizing it. And so, um, and once you do that, once you decouple those, then you can start playing around. You can do, oh, what up if we take a different objective function and apply a similar numerical algorithm to it or you know yeah how can we and how can we think about this numerical algorithm so gradient boosting came about i think of it that way it, thinking in these terms like thinking in terms of optimizing these functions and coming up with this clever way of thinking of what ada boost is doing numerically and generalizing it to other classes of functions and other kinds of learning problems and so specifically things like regression where you have real valued labels and so on. So, uh, so it's like a generalization of Adaboost in a word. <laughs> yeah, but so, a very but I, think, word. Yeah, I think that always happens essentially. The people try to understand something maybe better or I mean say differently. As you mentioned, now you have this kind of objective function and then optimizers that can, now you can even change the objective function to something else. And of course, the optimization can be changed to something else. And you see what are the combinations. I think that's, a, and these are all these kind of gradient, I mean, optimization in some sense, and others you can now apply there in some kind of local search that we are doing essentially, or yeah, this type of optimization that were there before and they like as a packages and you could apply them and you can get a, uh, nicely. So, did the people use other objective functions than the one that used that other boost? Um, yeah, you mean combined with boosting? Yes. Yeah. So, so they used ones more appropriate to um, regression problems and the kind of loss that's used with logistic regression and. And uh, was there any concept of regularizer there as well in the other boost or? Okay, Adaboost does not have regularization, which is one of the interesting things about it. I think I think some of these packages probably do, and they have certain kinds of. I don't I don't know what's exactly in those packages. So whatever I say about them, take with a grain of salt. But some of the techniques that were around were things like 
you know, just doing these very small updates, doing this kind of shrinkage where you don't do a full update, you kind of shrink it down a little bit or things with regularization. So this this was one of the mysteries of Attaboost. So that there was a there was a fair bit of mystery surrounding Attaboost in those days because um, because it does not have any kind of regularization. And you're building these gigantic models relative to the size of the data set. And so how does it how does it do that? You know, how does it how, why doesn't it overfit? Everybody, including us, was predicting it would overfit. That if you start running out of boost, you're building this very comp big complicated model, it should overfit the data, meaning does well on the training set, but does terrible on test data. That's what we were expecting. And it can do that, but it tends not to. The typical case is that it does not overfit, that you just run it for a thousand rounds. You've got this gigantic, complicated model, and yet it performs well. And if this sounds familiar it, to people in the field, it's because it is, because people are saying the same thing about deep learning now. You know, you have this complicated model, billions of parameters huge compared to the amount of data you have. How is it that it performs so well? So like in the late 90s, early 2000s, this was a kind of a big mystery and subject of controversy. And um, I mean, the, the way our suggestion for explaining that was um, what we call the margins theory, um, where, where you think about not just whether the algorithm is outputting a prediction that is correct or not, not the algorithm, but the prediction rule is making predictions that are correct or not, but you take into account the confidence in those predictions. And so add a boost, as you keep running it, those predictions are getting more and more confident and that that is what's translating into better performance regardless of how many rounds you run it for with, with the basic idea of that theory. So in some sense, you don't overfit. So in some, uh, and one other thing that I uh, like about, I mean, other, but I think one of the early algorithm that it, you could prove something for it. I mean, of course, there are lots of neural, uh, like the, this kind of deep nets, even with one layer, like one of the, I think important one, I will say this kind of word to vec and others, that there are lots of product to vec, graph to vec, and lots of other things that we are, some of them we are just using one layer, essentially one hidden layer, and still we cannot prove, I mean, any things for them. Yeah. But I think the other boost is the good thing that, I mean, you could actually prove in the performance of the algorithm, et cetera. Do you want to add anything about uh, like the uh, like the theorem that you had it or this, uh, the parameters? Well, there, there, was, there was a lot of theory. I mean, that, like kind of everything I've been talking about, well, maybe not gradient boosting, but even there, there's some theory, but but the other stuff, there was a lot of theory. So like we could prove, um, I mean, this whole notion of boosting is a mathematical property. It's saying you can prove if you have weak rules that are a little bit better than guess, guessing, you can prove that using those, you can get arbitrarily high accuracy not just on the training set, but on test data, given, you know, given enough data, blah, 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 all the usual assumptions. And the, the margins theory also is a theory. There are actually theorems where you can, um, again, prove, prove what I was talking about, that Attaboost increases the confidence in the predictions and that that translates into better performance on test data. So, so do you want to talk a little bit about the margins? Actually, that's another interpretation. Yeah. So, so mar margins is just a mathematical way of measuring this confidence that I'm talking about. So you can think of it that you can think of it that these these um, rules actually are outputting a real number in terms of their prediction. So they're not just predicting plus one or minus one if those are your labels, but they're predicting a real number, and then they're saying Okay, well, if this real number is bigger than zero, I'll say it's positive. If it's less than zero, I'll say it's a negative example. I'll say it's spam or not spam. So the margin is literally just the distance, the distance from zero in that prediction. So not so the closer you are to that decision boundary, 
the less confident you are, the smaller the margin. But then the farther, you know, the farther away from zero, that's more confidence, higher margin, less likely to be incorrect. And I think you had a paper on that one. I don't remember the exact uh, citation, but I think you had this explaining other boost using a uh, margin. Right. So do you but, remember which year was that? Um, which conference nine, was that? 98 or something. It wasn't a journal. That was in the old days when we send it to a conference and then also put it in a journal. It was called Boosting the Margin. I think that went to Annals of Statistics, I'm pretty sure. And uh, uh, what about the like the main uh, Adabus paper? When did you submit it? Did you submit it to some CS theory conferences first, or? Yeah, that was. There used to be a European learning theory conference called EuroCult, and later merged with Cult. So the conference went there, and then the journal version went to JCSS, I think. Yeah. JCSS. If you look at my website, you can yeah, find you all of get Bob. Dot GBLP, dot dot net. Yeah. yeah. And uh, uh, I just think this idea of like the, uh, I mean, boosting, as you mentioned, this is the idea that we are using a lot, like in randomized algorithm, that if the algorithm is a little bit better, more confident than like one half, generally you can boost it by running several times and essentially get the probability from one half almost to one essentially. So that's yeah. the type of things that we are using a lot in uh, randomized well, algorithm. Well, but can, yeah. Well, we were coming from the perspective of, theoretical computer scientists. So these were the types of ideas that were floating around. And the idea of weak learning, like I said, went back to um, Les Valiant and Michael Kearns, who were taking ideas from cryptography. This also comes up in cryptography and applying it to learning. And they were showing these problems are so hard that you can't even weakly learn them. You can't even do better than random guessing. And then that opened up the question, oh, if you can do better than random guessing, can you do arbitrarily high accuracy? But yes, the ideas go back to theoretical computer science for sure. Mm, uh, great, yeah. So um, I think now that I understand now why Ron became interested because of this cryptography part essentially that was there in the learning. So that yeah, now because, it makes sense essentially that work of Leslie Valiant and Mike Kern essentially. I'm pretty sure Ron said that they're they're like flip sides of each other. Because cryptography, you're trying to make things so hard that nobody can learn them, really, figure them out. And learning, you're trying to do the opposite. So, yeah, yeah absolutely. A good, actually, a good uh, I mean, vision, actually, about the things. Uh, great. So uh, now let's go to the bandits, um, contextual and uh, like adversarial bandits. And I think, again, it is some kind of, like, some part of your thesis that you were doing. Maybe these are some form of that that continued and you are still working on that. You want to talk a little bit about them and maybe maybe bandits for the general audience and then we can talk about contextual and the thing yeah. interesting thing here. Yeah, well we didn't we didn't talk at all about online learning yet. Um yeah. so, uh, so you want to uh, so I mean these are I know that you are very really excited no. about this convex so, analysis that infinity. Do we want to talk and essentially online things we want Choose your well, order, which one you want. Well, I, ju I just meant I, I, I should explain online learning to explain sure. bandits. <laughs> so, so the way we described learning so far, we were talking about getting a batch of examples and the learning algorithm outputs a prediction rule. And then that rule is, you know, makes predictions on new data. In online learning, instead, what happens is that the data, you, the learner is seeing data one point at a time. So you get it, the learner gets an example, makes a prediction, and immediately finds out if it's correct or not. And um, so like uh, you're, you know, every morning you need to make a prediction whether it's gonna rain or not. So you know whether to bring an umbrella with you or not. And then at the end of the day, you find out if your prediction was correct or not. So that's online learning. But the other thing that's really cool about online learning is you don't need to make examples about the data being random. So in the in the standard batch learning setting, you're assuming all the data is coming randomly. In the online model, you could even have an adversary who's controlling the data, who's controlling what example the learner sees and controlling the label that it's given. And you still can do learning in a meaningful way, even in this very, very adversarial model. So it's 
you know, very cool online learning. So in, in online learning, we're um, imagining that the learner makes a decision and then sees the effect and then, and then is able to figure out not just what its losses or what it's, what it pays for that one decision that it actually made, but also for all of the others. So let me try to make it a little bit more concrete. So like imagine you're a, um, you're a doctor and a patient comes to you and you have to make a decision about that patient. You know, do I prescribe this drug or do I do nothing? If you're the, a doctor making those decisions, you only actually see the effect of the decision that you actually made. You don't get to find out what would have happened if I had given the patient this other drug or what would have happened if I did nothing. So in online learning, you're assuming that you get to see what the effect would be of all of the actions that were available to you. But in a more realistic setting, you only find out for the one action that you actually took. So this kind of problem is called a bandit problem, it turns out. It's called a bandit is such a weird name, but it comes from an idealization of this, of this problem. So in the, the, the classic problem is called the two-armed bandit problem. So a one-armed bandit is a slot machine because it's got one arm and it steals your money. Yeah. <laughs> two, a two-armed bandit is where is this imaginary problem where you walk into a casino and there are two slot machines and they have different probability of payoff and you need to decide how to allocate your money between the two slot machines. If you knew which one had the higher payoff, you would always pull that, that one, right? You would always play the, the one with the higher payoff. But since you don't know, you have to do some amount of experimenting to try to figure out which one is the better one. And then you can play that one. But, you know, you're always thinking in the back of your mind, well, maybe, maybe I just, maybe the other one actually is better. And I should try the other one once in a while too. So this is called a bandit problem. And so traditionally, and it's an old problem, I think goes back to the 1920s. So traditionally the bandit problem assumes that the payoffs are random. But our idea was to combine bandits with online learning and to say, what happens if the payoffs are not random? What happens if it's like in the online learning setting where a bad guy is actually controlling the payoffs of the slot machines? And then it becomes a much harder problem because a bad guy could make one of the slot machines look really good at first. And then once you're always playing that one, Oh, actually, give the higher payoff to the other one that you're not playing. So that's the adversarial aspect of it. Yeah. So, so that that paper that we did that was with uh, Joao Freund and Nicolo Chesa Bianchi and Peter Auer. That paper that we did, the first thing it did was to consider an adversarial version of the bandit problem, where you don't make any statistical assumptions, and you're still trying to do almost as well as the best machine, or if you're in the setting of the doctor, like I was saying, you still want to give the best decisions that you can, even if, you know, things are not random. And then the other aspect of what we did was to, um, was to consider context, consider context in um, these settings. So in other words, like in the, in the setting with the doctor, you know, the doctor is not just making these blind decisions. The doctor has a lot of information about the patient knows about previous test results and the patient's, you know, gender and age and weight and blah, blah, blah. And that's called context. And so how do you make the best decisions you can using that contextual information? So we didn't call it that, but that's come to be called contextual bandits. And so that, that was another thing we did in that paper. So this was, yeah, a long time ago. Now it's become a really hot area because a lot of what's happening on the web is really the contextual bandits problem. You know, if you're on the web, if you're a website, somebody comes to your website, you need to decide which advertisement to show them. So the website has to make a decision of which ad to present 
and then finds out the payoff for that ad, but only for the one that was shown to the person. You know, the payoff being, you know, let's say, whether the person clicks on the ad or not. I think uh, like maybe a better example for the audience is like uh, also, I mean, of course, advertisement is a good one, but like if you go to Amazon and you try to buy something and then show some other product that you want to do it, it use essentially some of the contextual bandwidth or the other part, for example, at YouTube or like Facebook, you will go and you will see some videos, then it shows some other ones that you might be interested in. These are all of them or the some other, uh, like for the, or other, this type of short videos that now, or a rail essentially at face at uh, Instagram that you are seeing one and then next one it decides whether you go fast or slow on this one to decide which one it should show the other ones. All of them are essentially using this important concept of uh, a contextual bandit. So uh, one question, uh, actually the, uh, one person in the audience asked, so is there a difference between like bandit and uh, regret minimizations? Are they the same essentially, the same setting or different? Okay. so um regret minimization so in either the online or the bandit setting how do you make these things meaningful so like if an if, if a bad guy is controlling the weather in that example with the rain then every time you every time you predict rain and you bring the umbrella then this bad guy is going to say no you were wrong and it'll be a bright sunny day and every day you forget the umbrella because you think it's going to be sunny you know Oh, that day it rains, which does seem to happen. But um, so, how do you make how do you make learning meaningful in this setting? You make it meaningful by imagining that there's a bunch of rules that you could have used to make these predictions based on the information that you have, and then you compare your own performance. When I say you, I mean the learning algorithm. So you compare the learning algorithm's actual performance to the best rule it could have used if it had known ahead of time which one was the best. So you're comparing actual performance to best possible performance. That's called regret. And so all of these algorithms are trying to minimize regret. And that's, that's their aim is to minimize regret. So regret is, minimization is a little bit more general. You can talk about regret minimization in any online setting. And bandits are just one particular form of online learning, kind of a specialized form of online learning. Yeah. So it's something like in the slot machine that you mentioned, you always consider, you compare yourself with the best arm in the hindsight that you will take, for example, this arm all right. the time. Because possibly in each uh, like time that you try, you may take a different arm and still you get a better thing. So you may get a much more money, but that might be very hard to chase. So in some sense, we will consider somehow in the middle ground, I mean, there are some versions actually they consider more general version, but generally we consider say one arm that is doing the best and you will just take that one, not that you will skip at every time to the best one. That might be hard essentially to compete with. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, one thing. And uh, one other thing is that like in practice, uh, lots of these uh, companies, for example, for online learning, the way that they are doing is that like the, you get the data, you always train the data in the, so like at, at night, like for example, for you want to get the probability of click or any other things. So, and of course it changes any time, but you can just get the data in the past two weeks, run it, say tonight, and then you will apply that one for tomorrow. Again, tomorrow at night, you will take the past two weeks and you will do that. This is the way that they are essentially make online is more like offline. Yeah. Uh, uh, like, have you considered any algorithm like this type of thing for like uh, analysis or getting any? Yeah, I mean, the yes. So so the simple thing is to take all the data you've, you've collected and and then train it at night and then and then use that for the next day. Um, the, the problem is you, you, you can get into these traps where, um, okay, so the problem with doing that is you have, there, there's bias in the way that you collected the data because you've been using a rule that prevent, presents the advertisements. And so you only get, are getting data on the advertisements that you actually presented if we're talking about that web example. Um, and so the data that you're getting is biased. 
And when you have that kind of bias, then you can't actually prove anything about these algorithms and you really can't get trapped. I don't, I don't think I can think of a good paradox off, off the top of my head, but there, there are examples of this type of thing. And, th and this type of thing happens in medical experiments all the time. Of course, if you choose the, the subjects that get treatment or don't get treatment in a biased way, then it can completely destroy the validity of the experiment. You can get very, very misleading results with, it, with experiments. It, when you're trying to tell if a drug works or not. So in some so, sense, you are talking about the exploration. So in some sense, if you want to do that, you want to say it's more like exploitation that we are using the past data and we need a bit more of exploration actually too. Yes, that's exactly right. But but having said that, there are methods that that do this. So there are methods that take exactly this problem into account and um, and then and then use it to, and then and then modify the way that the data is collected. Like the simplest, the simplest thing to do is to most of the time use the rule that you think is going to work. So most of the time you do exploitation, but every once in a while you mix in um, some exploration rounds where you just try something random or you try something different. And so there there are ways you can prove that these will actually work and and some of the algorithms that have been developed in recent years work exactly the way you're describing where you do this modified way of collecting data so you're actually using the algorithm while collecting data but in a way that's more statistically sound and then you take that data and you you train on that big batch of data so you're using a batch learning algorithm to find the rule that you use going forward into the into the future. Yeah, I think this uh, they call it, if I remember, uh, off policy reinforcement learning or this type of thing that you have the data. Yeah, it's a little bit simpler than reinforcement learning, but yeah, it's it's a similar idea. Yeah, and yeah. so this algorithm like Thomson sampling or UCB are the more like maybe simpler one that they are doing this kind of exploration exploitation that the people can take a look at them and these are this is a great thing so lots yeah. of things are going for bandits and these are nice yeah algorithms. well like, if people want to read more so um like a paper that we had on doing exactly what you're describing is um called taming the monster it was called the name of the paper is it kind of comes from an inside joke but it's basically doing exactly what i was describing yeah great and what yeah. was the title <laughs> uh it's ta ta yeah. taming the monster taming uh, the monster i can't i can't remember the rest it's taming the yeah. monster colon something something but <laughs> uh, good <laughs> uh, uh good so i think uh, maybe uh yeah i think that would be a good time maybe i think this actually is related to game theory then we go to convex analysis at infinity okay that, uh, so i think uh, but i think this bandit is sometimes is also i mean this is in some kind of game theory in the sense that these are like, for example, you, you talk, we think about YouTube or Instagram as a person who try to show these things. And at the same time, like these are the customers we can, you can think about as a player that they may try to actually see this. And there might be some kind of, uh, I mean, selfishness in the people essentially, or some kind of adversarial things that they may want to actually change the algorithm that is used by YouTube or Facebook. Or anyhow, there are some incentives that are involved in these things. So uh, I think, and you have done actually great work on these uh, things to uh, connection to game theory. I think we had some papers actually with the average on the, this kind of the, we call it price of total anarchy that was talking about when these people in game theory, they are not going according to best response, but they are doing regret minimization type of things. And you can actually get some good performance. And uh, you had also some other works on that one. So I think like uh, in general game theory, connection of game theory and ML. So that would be good to add more insight. There. Yeah, well, um, right. So the online learning setting already feels like a game. That's true between the learning algorithm and the adversary. Um, and well, okay, maybe, maybe I should describe the history a little bit. So we, by the way, you didn't mention that I was AT at Bell Labs. <laughs> a lot of this work was done at at and Bell Labs before I went to Princeton. Yeah, so and I wanted to ask at the end that we talked okay. about the industry. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. So, yeah. so um, 
I was at Bell Labs with you off Freund, and we got very interested in online learning. And one of the things we did was, uh, so at Bell, Lab, Bell Labs has this history of um, creating what, what were called mind reading machines. So Hagel Barger um, created one of these and Claude Shannon made one after that. And they were literally machines that would play the matching pennies game. So matching pennies is where you and I each decide on heads or tails. And if we both, and if what we picked matches, then I win. And if they don't match, then you win. So that's called matching pennies. So it's like, you're, you're trying to guess what the other person is going to do. So it's got this mind reading aspect. And at the same time, you're trying to be unpredictable. So the other person won't guess what you're doing. So it's got this mind reading aspect to it. And they, they created these machines, like I said, physical machines to play this game in the 1950s. So we were there at Bell Labs working on online learning, and we thought it would be great fun to create a modern version of this. And so we created a game in software, not a, not a game, a, an algorithm um, that you could play to um, play, play matching pennies in the great Bell Labs tradition. And then we sent it around to a few people one of the people said, oh, can you use this to play rock, paper, scissors instead of matching pennies? And this is the type of simple question that you know leads to all kinds of research because we started thinking about that and realized that not only could you generalize it to rock, paper, scissors, but you could generalize it to whatever game you wanted to. And um, and so we started thinking about games and how you could play these repeated games using online learning. And at some point, somehow we realized that you could actually use this to solve boosting. That even though boosting just seems completely different, it, you know, the data is random, you have this weak learner, it's just a completely different setting. But we realized that you could set up a game so that you're effectively solving a boosting problem and just the totally standard boosting uh, standard boosting setting. And um, so so then we could take an online algorithm that already existed, which was basically the weighted majority algorithm of Nick Littlestone and Manfred Varmuth. We could basically take that and apply it to this game, which we've derived from boosting and end up with an new boosting algorithm. And that's actually where Adaboost came from. So Adaboost actually came out of this crazy roundabout way, this weird connection between boosting and game theory and online learning. And um, so that, that's where Adaboost came from. And you know there were these other connections too, like so boosting and online learning, it turned out, you know, they're they're both instances of this general game playing algorithm where you're playing the same game over and over again, like you're playing Maybe matching pennies so. over and over again, or rock, paper, scissors. It turns out that they're actually the same game for both of the standard setting for online learning and boosting, but where you've just reversed the roles of the two players. Like in chess, if you just reverse who's playing white and who's playing black, it's the same thing if you reverse the who's playing which side of the game you go from boosting to online learning or online learning to boosting. And then, and then we also found that you could apply this to game theory. So you could take an existing online learning algorithm and use it to prove the min-max theorem. So the min-max theorem is like the fundamental theorem of zero-sum games goes back to von Neumann. But by taking standard an analysis of online learning like I said, due to Littlestone and Varmuth, and applying it to game theory, you could actually prove the min-max theorem in like six lines, you know, six, six math lines. It's like this incredibly simple proof. And so it was just, you know, so we ended up with all these connections between these different, these three areas, boosting online learning and game theory. They all turned out to be very, very closely connected. So I think it was also the third one, like I think maybe the fourth one, the optimization. That's also very connected to all of them because I think, as you mentioned, even like 
this and is this min max theorem is actually an optimization problem as well in some sense yeah that's true that's true so in some sense these are like very uh, close by and uh, uh, and one uh, question i think somebody asked so have you uh, uh, have you written like uh, you were at bell labs and then at and and then at microsoft well at and bell labs are the same but it was at and uh, bell laboratories then later split uh, yeah right. exactly I'm, uh, but i think when the, uh, you were after i think they became bell labs and at and two separate things and you continued at at and t am Correct. i right at it, it became called at and t labs right yeah, so exactly. it's at and t bell labs and then when it split i went with at and t labs all the machine learning went on at and t labs yeah. i said yeah i was part of the Almost family all. as well like <laughs> i think i uh, later i joined i think much later 2007 with at and t yeah, to ATT, yeah. Oh, yeah. I was okay. there actually for five years as well. So that like on there, they, David Johnson. I mean, we talked about oh. him actually with uh, with Mihaly Siamakis also. We talk about this quite a bit about this. I think lots of great actually theory came out of it. And so one question somebody asked: So uh, are you uh, have you done programming back then? Because you talk about software, and what about nowadays at Microsoft Research? Are you doing any programming? Now? Uh, I did do programming back when I was at AT and T. So we ran a lot of experiments. Once we finally got over, <laughs> once we decided to do experiments, we started doing a lot of experiments. And um, yeah, I wrote that game. I don't remember now, but a fair bit of programming. Now I do very little programming. I'm embarrassed to say. Yeah, yeah. Actually, I didn't do it. I mean, that much more recently. But I mean, like, but the, like few years ago, I think Python is a very good one. I think if you, that's a it's a much high level language that you can do a lot. And lots of these things, there are packages you don't need to write from scratch. You just get it essentially, import something, and you can do mm -hmm. a lot with that. Uh, Good. Uh, so now I think let's go to the this uh, convex analysis. This is the research that you are doing more uh, recently. And uh, convex analysis at infinity. Maybe you actually want to say what do you say? What uh, what do you mean by convex analysis yeah. at infinity? And I think you are writing a book on that as well. Maybe. Right. So um, okay. Well, we already talked about Adaboost and how Adaboost is minimizing a particular objective function. So that objective function turns out to be convex. So a function is convex. You know, when we think of convex functions, we're thinking of these nice ball shape type mm -hmm. functions that you're trying to minimize and just convex optimization problems where you want to minimize a convex function. They just come up all over the place, all over machine learning, statistics, all kinds of fields. Very, very important area. But you asked before about Adaboost being regularized, and it's not reg regularized. And what that means is that the minim minimum of that function is off at infinity. It has no finite minimizer. And this can happen with convex functions. So like I said, we often think of convex functions as kind of like bowl-shaped like this, and then you have this nice minimum at the bottom of the bowl. But a convex function doesn't have to be like that. It can be more like a slide type of a shape, like think of the exponential function like e to the x. e to the x is convex, but it has no finite minimizer. To minimize e to the x, you have to minimize it with a sequence that goes off to negative infinity. We kind of want to say e to the x is minimized at negative infinity, but it's, it's not. It's minimized by a sequence going to negative infinity. And the same thing happens in many dimensions in algorithms like Adaboost. And so from my years of working on Adaboost, this was a problem that I thought about a lot. How do we think about these, these the solutions, what's being computed by these algorithms if it has no finite minimizer so that it's not converging to a, to a finite point? And so we started thinking about what it is converging to. And so the idea of this project is to take our notion of Euclidean space, just our regular notion of space, and to expand it where we add all these points at infinity, which become the points that an algorithm like Adaboost can converge to. And so that's kind of the idea of the project. And so we want to do it in such a way that the space that we're working in even though it's larger, has 
nicer mathematical properties. Like for instance, it's compact for people who know what compactness is. It's just this really nice mathematical property. So even though it's larger, it's compact. And we also wanted to be able to take all these ideas from convex analysis and port them over to this larger space so that you can do things like, um, you know, compute gradients. Like, what does it mean to have a gradient for a point that's off at infinity? Well, we, we have this way of doing that, a natural way of doing that. Um, so in some and, sense, I mean, you like in some sense, the convex would be nice, as you mentioned, the like bowel shape is more like natural. Yeah. But as you mentioned, I mean, not always the case. It's sometimes we don't have this bowel shape. And in some sense, the theory, I mean, the new thing that the theory that you have, you try to make, I mean, even this type of maybe not bowel shape, essentially make a ball shape such that we can have a nice analysis for them. And yeah, well, kind of the entire world becomes a, a ball is, is the way to think, is maybe the way to think about it. I mean, convex functions, you know, in, you know, the one dimensional case like e to the x is just so simple, it's kind of deceptive. Once you go to two or more dimensions, the number of ways of going to infinity just becomes really hard to think about. Because you know you can go to infinity in all different directions, for instance, um, and so, and what we want to do is we want to take those points at infinity and kind of make them into their own mathematical objects. I mean, like there's there's an analogy that we use to think about what we're doing. So, you know, if you if you imagine going back to the time of Pythagoras, where they only knew about rational numbers, they had a problem because, you know, they wanted to measure, say, the length of the diagonal in a unit square. If you just have a one by one square and you want to measure its diagonal, of course, today we know that that diagonal is has length square root of two, but they only knew about rational numbers. numbers. And so they didn't know what to do they, because they realized they were able to prove that there is no rational number which is equal to that length, which is equal to square root of two. And so they would do stuff like um, come up with sequences, sequences of rational numbers that they knew converged to what we now call square root of two to this particular length. And so you could go on doing mathematics where you don't have irrational numbers. You don't have numbers like square root of two, you just, do everything with sequences, but it would just be, you know, a huge mess. It doesn't make sense. We want to think of numbers less like square root of two as mathematical objects mm -hmm. in their own right. So that's what we're trying to do here. We have this problem that we have functions we care about. We want to know what their minimizers are, but they don't have minimizers at any finite point. And so instead, what we want to do is to expand the space of points that we're talking about, adding all these points at infinity. And now rather than talking about a function being minimized by a sequence, we can talk about that same function being minimized by one of these points at infinity, which becomes, you know, each of those points becomes a mathematical object in its own right again. So uh, are you doing some transformation on the function? I try to get a little bit more we're, about So we're not we're not transforming the function, but we're expanding the space we're working in. I see. And and we expand the function. So we start with a function and then we expand it so that it's a function on that larger space. The largest space. Like e to the x, you know, that's an easy example. E to the x. You just define, you add points plus infinity and minus infinity. At plus infinity, you define the function to be plus infinity. And at minus infinity, you define it to be zero because, you know, imagine the exponential, right? Yeah. It goes to infinity at positive infinity and it goes to zero at negative infinity. So now you've expanded the function to this larger space and you can talk about you know, all these different things about this expanded function, not very interesting in one dimension, but in multiple dimensions, it becomes pretty, pretty involved and pretty Great. interesting. And, and so you just add these two uh, minus infinity and plus infinity, not yeah. all in between, like not the sequence itself, correct? 
Just these two points. Right. So finished. they become the limits of sequences. The limits. Right. So the question that why you cannot do it always, why cannot always add this kind of the minimum things, adding it to the function and define it? Oh, well, you, you can do it, but in, in, in two or more dimensions, it just becomes much less obvious how to do it. I see, I see. Because in two dimensions, you know, you have all different directions that you could go oh, yeah, in. In yeah. three so dimensions, yeah. you know, again, yeah, you have all different directions, but then are looking at directions enough? Is it enough to just consider trajectories that head off in a straight line? Yeah, the so I think in two dimensions, not. the number of even these limitations becomes like infinite, so that you need to be yeah much more careful about uh, this yeah. so that's good actually i think uh, we were talking about open problems here i think that's uh, so do you have the answer for that or is there some nice open <laughs> problems in this area that um what are some open problems well um okay well in in the convex analysis stuff or in general i mean you can just start with convex analysis the well the convex future. analysis i mean it's a brand new area what we're doing so we still have a lot of questions but they're kind of they're kind of of a kind of technical uh, nature because we're we're trying to take a lot of what happens in convex analysis and expand it to this larger space that I've been talking about. And so there are some standard properties of convex sets and convex functions that we don't know the answers to there. Um, uh, uh, good. So uh, yeah. So is. But I mean, so you can say, I think the people can read about the, uh, do you have the book? I mean, the, any version of the book? Uh, oh, it's, it's on archive. It's on archive and it's yeah, going to be, it's, it's going to be published. So, we so I think that would be a good now. way the people will go and find nice yeah. problems, especially if you're PhD students and these are nice problems. But what about open problems in other areas? Um, well, I'm not sure I have any good technical problems in general. Um, it, yeah. I think... I think in terms of research directions, I'm I'm not sure that AI systems are reaching a point where they have understanding of any kind. I mean, it's okay. The jury is still out with things like these large language models. To what extent they understand? So I don't know what I don't know whether they solve the problem or not. Whether they really understand things, but there's a way that humans understand things, which I think is different. Than machines, that that humans humans have a kind of understanding that they bring to the world that I'm not sure AI systems have in the same way. I think this is kind of tied up with reliability, how reliable systems are. Like, you know, think about, um, you know, if you live in a place like New York City, just think about how many times you cross the street in a year, or if, or if you regularly drive a car. I think how many times you drive a car in a year, it's got to be tens of thousands. And you think of how many times, you know, how many decisions you're making, like every time you cross the street, every time you make a left turn, if you're driving and so on, you're just making a huge number of decisions without getting killed, without having an accident. Um, and so so I, I feel like that has to do not just with how much data went into, you know, went into right. you <laughs> in terms of learning to drive and in terms of um, crossing the street. I think that it also has to do with the fact that we have these models of the world that we can use to process new situations in a way much better than any of our learning algorithms, you know, these kind I of, think, these crazy weird settings. I can, so in I, some sense, I think understanding like the maximum use from the current data that you have in some sense, this is some kind of, because you can put all the, as you mentioned, we may not get that much data, but maybe we have, we are making better models that this model actually can optimize and essentially help us. And I think this actually, when I was reading about ChatGPT, that's the, somehow the way that they are doing essentially is like the, so they are not putting all the web or like, the, uh, I think, or like the way that they are doing with some of this kind of uh, labeling data, they are doing that. They are not doing for every data they are labeling it, but for relatively limited set of data, I think like around 
36,000 or something like this, and they could still get good results. So I think we may go to that direction, but I think that's somehow my understanding from your uh, questions. Uh, but with one other things also, I think you are like for the more applied things you want to talk about the uh, uh, max and for a species dis distribution modeling. I think is this like more, uh, have you, is it applied? You may want to say a few words on that as well. Um, okay, sure. So that that's older work that I did with uh, Stephen Phillips and um, Mira Dudik and some others. So um, that was it started when I was still at AT and T with Stephen Phillips, and um, yeah, it's a it's a great example of how you can do something really of value by starting out by talking to the people who need something. <laughs> and so Stephen Phillips. Uh, somehow made contact with people at the American Museum of Natural History and had started talking to them about what would be useful to them. And it turned out that the problem that was, they thought would be really useful is um, this problem of modeling the distribution, the population distribution of plants and the animals. So they had this problem that, um, you know, you go out to the field and you, um, you're interested in some particular species of butterfly, let's say. And so you see this butterfly at certain locations on the map, maybe 20 locations, not a huge number, usually a very small number of locations. And then there's all kinds of other data available to them, like average rainfall at every point on the map and altitude and temperature and so on. And so you wanna take all this data where they have a lot of data about things like rainfall and altitude and so on, and this small number of sightings of the butterfly and try to get a map, an estimate of the where this butterfly likes to live. You're trying to get, get a, um, yeah, create, create a map of where this, this butterfly likes to live. And um, so that was the problem. And then Stephen started talking to me and we had this idea of, using maximum entropy to do it. Maximum entropy is this old statistical method, um, which turns out to be related to boosting because everything is related to boosting. And yeah. in my brain anyway, everything is related to boosting. <laughs> and um, so, so uh, yeah, we created a package for them. And um, then Miro Dudik, who was my student at that time, or became my student soon after that, um, got involved and, and as far as I know, they're still using it. It's it's available on, the software is available on the American Museum of Natural History's website, at least the last time I looked it was, and people were still using it, so. Yeah, so that's a great point, be more, especially the real practical things that the people are uh, using it. Uh, so one question actually the people uh, ask, so uh, is there any, I mean, like a uh, aspect of deep learning that you can also say is like, somehow is the other boost or boosting in general? That deep so, learning is? I mean, like the deep nets essentially, or neural nets. So can you, for example, I mean, this is some question essentially, that uh, can you maybe interpret, I mean, the way that these neural nets are working in terms of other boost or is there any relation mm. between them or? Yeah, I don't know. I think I'll have to pass on that question. I don't think I really have anything to add to that. Um, uh, yeah, so, I don't know. Uh, good. So uh, is there any other research things that you want to talk about or any other open problems oh. that you want to say? Well, I, I feel like we covered a lot of ground. So, <laughs> And any no other open problem that you have it like more, if you want to say about that? if you can't think about any. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I don't know. It's a good question to always be thinking about what the important directions are. I mean, like I said, I've got this list of problems in my head for the convex analysis project. Um, you know, maybe one, one, one general direction there is that we, the idea of this project was to build up a whole mathematical foundation, you know, because convex optimization in general is so powerful. It's used in so many different fields all the time. But part of the reason it's so powerful is because it's built on this 
foundation of convex analysis, this beautiful mathematical field, um, very, very powerful area. And um, so we're, we're trying to do the same thing. We're trying to build up this theory from the ground up, these foundations, with the intention eventually that this should be a value in the area of convex optimization to actually solving practical problems. And so that part is still largely open. I mean, there's a lot that's open, but that part, I feel like there's really a lot to do. Taking the theory that we've developed and try to apply it to um, various algorithms or to derive new algorithms and so on. So that would be good, I think. And uh, like, I think they can read your book and archive and then people. Yeah. Maybe just this start with, if you're interested, just start with the intro. Yeah. <laughs> Don't download it and go, oh my God, this is 300 pages. Yeah. <laughs> just start with the intro. <laughs> yeah, I think generally, I mean, I always suggest to, uh, my, I mean, the PhD students that like reading the intro of the paper is one of the best that they can get. You get a vision about the whole thing, essentially, without going to some of the details. So of course, yeah, we, I mean, try, we they... tried to make it that way. So, yeah, <laughs> we tried to make the intro not to... <laughs> No. So uh, now, uh, actually, let's, I mean, uh, uh, talk a little bit about, I mean, I think uh, now about the life is something. So you got your PhD from MIT. Then I think you went to uh, AT&T Bell Labs at that time, correct? So uh -huh. that's the things. And then you went and then around, uh, don't remember the year, but you were also, I mean, like around 2000, then you were, or something like this, that you went to Princeton and you have been professor for several years there. And mm -hmm. then you again joined Microsoft Research. So in some sense, you have done both industry and academia. So one question that, I mean, did you try actually after your PhD to go uh, to some universities or you just wanted to like find the labs is better? And then you went to Princeton and then you went again to uh, Microsoft Research. So yeah, tell us about the story, boy. Well, <laughs> about the um, after... After graduate school, I um, um, well, I applied everywhere. I mean, so so it, it was actually a very bad year for being on the job market, and um, you know, kind of like this year, it was it was it was a terrible year, and the year before had been a terrible year. So at least I had warning that it was going to be a terrible year. So I I applied to a lot of places, and um, both labs, and I don't think I. Yeah, no, I did apply to Bell Labs, but it was kind of a roundabout. I didn't apply to the department that actually hired me. That 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 happened kind of indirectly. Um, so I, I could have been happy at a university. I might have even preferred a university, but but and I, I had some offers, but yeah, what can I say? So I picked Bell Labs. I picked AT and T, and I was really happy there. And um, so for how many years have you been there? Oh, one thing, one thing they did at at t so it was Ron Brockman who hired me. And it was, they did, they did not have a lot of machine learning at that point. There was William Cohen, but um, most of the others were more like AI. And, um, but Ron Brockman was able to get an offer for both me and Michael Kearns, who I had worked closely with. Yeah. And so we both joined at the same time. And that, that made it very attractive, the fact that he <laughs> had, had made an offer to both of us since we already knew we could work together. And then little by little over the years, that group grew and became more directed towards machine learning. And um, by, I guess, the, by around the year 2000, we just had an amazing set of people at at and I'm not even sure people really appreciate how amazing at t was at that time for machine learning. I mean, because we had me and um, Michael Kearns. I mean, some of these people had left by then, but they had all passed passed through. Um, Yoav Freund, Yoram Zinger, then uh, Rich Sutton in reinforcement learning, um, Chris Watkins, who invented Q-learning, Jan LeCun um, doing neural nets, Patrick Hafner, neural nets, um, you know, and the list, the list goes on. It was just Satinder Singh and reinforcement learning, Dave McAllister. It was just an amazing, amazing set of people all in one I place. Think, uh, Corina, uh, Corina yeah, Corina Cortez, Cortez yeah. right, was there. Mary Amori was there. So 
I know I'm, I'm leaving people <laughs> off. So forgive me if anybody's listening. I can't remember yeah. everybody off the top of my head. But the point is, it was just a fantastic set of people. It was really exciting. And each of uh, several of these people actually became, I mean, went to different like labs, like you went yeah. to Microsoft. I mean, I think Corina went to uh, Google and uh, Lacun went to Facebook. These all become the leaders of this Facebook, Google, Microsoft uh, things. Yeah. Uh, and, well, yeah, well. So yeah, what 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 happened was in, um, you know, there was first of all, long distance was, which is what AT and T made its money well, off of, yeah. was getting smaller and smaller. They were in wireless. It wasn't so successful. You know, the business part. Maybe I shouldn't talk about the business part, but basically their business was shrinking, yeah. and so things were constantly getting tightened up. And then September 11th hit. And September 11th was kind of like COVID. Like we thought it was huge at the time. Of course, COVID is was even bigger economic disruption than anything ever. But but September 11th was also a huge economic disruption. And after that, they announced that there were going to be layoffs. So everybody went on the job market. They said there were going to be layoffs, but didn't say who. And in the end, um, like our department and our lab was were decimated. And uh, so, so people got spread around all over the place, mostly to universities, mostly people, you know, they were like, oh, I really do want this tenure thing, you know, <laughs> tenure actually yeah. really, really would be really nice. And so that was the, I didn't get laid off, but I went to, I was already on the job market and all my friends were gone and I was mad at the company. And so, you know, so I, I left also and went to Princeton. And so I was uh, there for 11 years. Yeah. And then you decided uh, with Microsoft. Yeah. yeah Again, so, you and didn't want I, the tenure thing. <laughs> yeah. Well, tenure was nice, but I but I went on sabbatical at, well, I had visited that group a few times. That group at Microsoft, they all used to be at Yahoo. And then when yeah. Yahoo fell apart, Jennifer Chase moved in and hired all of them for a new lab in Microsoft. So I had been visiting that group quite a bit but then I went on sabbatical there and it was just so much fun I just really enjoyed working with people and so yeah so I made the switch again <laughs> yeah so that's like <laughs> I remember actually that I was visiting at that time I think there was a big party when you resigned from Princeton and you just became I mean because it's for some time you were at both places in some sense uh, you could you mean a party at microsoft yeah i think that was the, oh uh, they that's, uh, yeah they buy they got me a cake yeah yeah <laughs> that was nice yeah. that was yeah nice. so that was the uh, great thing and uh, like uh, and uh, like i think somehow it's like similar to this year that around 2000 that you mentioned that lots of companies actually are uh, have a layoff others so uh but so far i mean you are enjoying that microsoft and everything is uh, yeah yeah. Hey, hey, I mean, are there anything comparison between current Microsoft and AT and T? Which one you think more flexible? I mean, if you want. Well, to... I mean, AT and T supported basic research, and Microsoft is really nice. They also support basic research, so it's been really nice. It's we also have a great group of people at Microsoft. Um, I think Microsoft does a better job of taking advantage of technology and their research at AT and T. At at t it, it felt like there was, it was just harder to get people in the company, in the company. to listen to what, what we were doing and, you know, to take advantage of what was happening in research. It was, it was just harder. Microsoft has much more of a culture of, yes, we care about research. Yes, we really want to be leaders in the field and so on. Yeah, I think the other side of that, I think I really actually appreciate Microsoft because that also was like when I started my PhD 2001, actually, at that time also, I mean, even before that, Jennifer actually, David Chase actually started that group at Redmond and I was visiting there and it was like real research that was going there. So it was very good in that sense. But nowadays, I mean, you know, Google, uh, Facebook, and uh, like uh, Amazon, these are the things that they are essentially using the research really for products. And mm -hmm. I have been at, like, at Amazon, that's like quite different culture than, for example, at uh, Microsoft research. Google also become I mean, good. I think sometimes there's a good actually research is going there. But you mm -hmm. know, yeah, mm -hmm. this 
companies. Maybe this Bellab type of things is not there. I mean, even I, I remember actually when I was at at and at that time, I was talking, I was doing some networking things. And of course, at and was all about the networks and others. But when we talk even with the networking people, so oh, this is like, you know, let's have a paper. It's very hard to have a really compact, uh, like impact in the company business. <laughs> but yeah, but I think this type of uh, things, like more applied thing is more new companies that they are uh, doing there. Uh, great. And uh, I think uh, like uh, these are like maybe some, uh, uh, Faster question you can answer like fast. So you're actually in the National Academies of uh, uh, Science and Engineering. And so uh, yeah, I think maybe a few words you want to tell about them. I mean, so what's the impact? I mean, do, do you see actually that this, uh, like, uh, do you see any impacts in this thing that's happening or what is the actual functions of this? academies um, I mean, if you want to add anything yeah, I'm, not, <laughs> I'm not sure i'm really prepared to answer that i mean i think the national academies are supposed to be one of their functions is to advise the federal government i think that's why they were originally created so you would get and, and, so that i mean that does it take your time also to do this thing or are involved in those um things? well i'm ashamed to say that i'm one of these members who doesn't do very much I mean, there are elections to elect new members, so I participate in those, but I haven't, I'm, there, I think there are quite a few members like me who <laughs> don't, don't do that much, I'm ashamed to say. <laughs> but, but, but they have committees, essentially. Yes, that they, they do, they do, they do a lot, but I don't do a lot. Yes, yes, that, as, uh, as just, the National yeah. Academies are great, yeah, because they, you know, they, they, they create leadership in all these different fields. You know, so they're they make statements about things like, you know, vaccines and all kinds of different things. And so so the National Academies are a great thing. I'm all in favor of them. I'm just yeah. not. Yeah, I, should, I mean, I think don't we participate in them as uh, much Professor, as I should. Uh, uh, Sevi Galil also <laughs> two weeks ago, and he mentioned also he was more involved, maybe, I mean, essentially mm-hmm. bringing new members, etc. But uh, but yeah, I think there are some uh, things like that. different people are. Have a different aspect on it. Uh, good. So I think, uh, yeah. So let me. Uh, uh, have you talked about? I mean, this is like somebody else uh, asked us as well. So have you talked about any having a startup? I mean, being both in industry and academia. Um, have you tried to? I guess. Talk I guess I. I guess I've I've thought about it a little bit in the past, but I've never actually done it. Um, that. So so there was a time when. Um, there was a short time when AT&T was talking about doing these, uh, I can't remember what they called them, incubators or spinoffs where they would like create little companies inside the company and then, I don't know, spin them off or something. I don't remember how it was supposed to work. So we, we talked about that a fair bit and never really got anything off the ground. And on, honestly, most of the time I've, uh, honestly, most of the time I'm such a conservative person, I've been afraid to, give up a steady salary and yeah, go, go the, you know, because I mean, sometimes you can do it as a university professor where you, you, you keep your job as a professor and you do the startup on the side. I know some people are able to do that, but to go all the way to a startup and risk losing a steady salary, it was, I, I'm too, cons- my wife and I are too conservative. Yeah. We were afraid to like, <laughs> think- well, how do we send our kids to college? You know, we were, <laughs> so uh, I think you have uh, played enough, I mean, like uh, this uh, study enough, like uh, this kind of uh, slot machines and others essentially in the, because in some sense, actually a startup, I mean, getting, having a successful startup is like a lottery and it's not I that mean, easy that you will make a, I mean, right. yeah, the people talk about it, you will just need a successful one, but you don't see how many that failed essentially to get these things. So that's yeah. like the things that... Yeah, it's, it's, I mean, it's completely understandable. I'm more, uh, I'm more driven by, you know, interest in the research itself. So, and that you need actually more money, a so. stable place like in a university yeah. or like some places like yeah. AT&T at that time or uh, Microsoft. Uh, no, they thought they had some layoff, but <laughs> hopefully that's not uh, does not affect that much research. Uh, good. So I think one other person asked about the chat GPT. I think we just talked briefly about it. So how do you think about it? I think this is a hot topic nowadays. I mean, you want to say something about it? Um, well, I think the first thing to say is I don't know a lot about them. Um, so, um, but 
they certainly seem quite amazing. I, I, I did log on to chat GPT and try it out and it's pretty amazing. I asked it to write a abstract, abstract for a paper about boosting and it did a pretty credible job. It was kind of, it was a little bit, um, it was, it was kind of like, like if a student took a class and they kind of were repeating a lot of stuff without actually understanding it, it kind of had that <laughs> feeling, but it was pretty good. <laughs> Yeah, actually, I was so reading some the articles there. It could actually, they, they had some exams, so they gave this was some interesting thing. It was just reading that they, this, they have a recent study. They they had some exams in business school and other places, I mean, at Columbia and uh, I think at UPenn and others. And then uh, they asked ChatGPT to answer that, and the professor or grader essentially graded them without knowing who has written this one. It mm -hmm. could actually get a C plus in all courses that took and in some like business school actually it got b or b minus as well oh, so okay. it was uh, that was actually quite uh, interesting and uh, yeah i think this is also one interesting thing that i was uh, also reading about it that's uh, that that is interesting so this is uh, i mean the people uh, that wasn't the news that google is in like alert because of that and in some sense google actually brought this maybe expectation because before at google you were searching some words and they just gave something but then they have added to this nowadays i always essentially search a sentence at google and then it brings some answers for me that generally takes it from some article that it finds it on the web now, this expectation when it comes, that's actually the one that ChatGPT actually answered it much better because it does, does not bring just one article for you, but brings essentially the whole text and somehow create it for you. And it's not like from one particular place on the web, you cannot find it. It somehow try to get the whole knowledge and create it. And I think that's actually a great thing about ChatGPT that I think Google rightly, I will say, is a bit afraid of it because the people can start using it. And something like even Grammarly or others that the people are using it or some at, uh, Google, for example, Gmail, it fixed this one. The fixes that ChatGPT is doing is much more substantial and much nicer, I will say, to this kind of Grammarly or other like the Gmail that it just changes a little bit about your thing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Anyhow, I think the people can go there and this yeah. is a lot to be I'll, about. I'll, I'll, just, I'll just say that compared to where we were when I was in graduate school in the, the late 80s. I mean, I just never thought we would get to this point in my lifetime. I really did not. These things yeah. seem so hard. I really did not think we'd get, I mean, even, even something as simple as recognizing spoken digits, you know, when somebody's just saying, you know, just, just saying a digit, three, two, one, and to be able for a computer yeah. to figure out what digit was said, that was such a hard problem. <laughs> yeah, and now it, it, it's uh, just amazing that we can solve these. <sighs> Go ahead. In, in some sense, I think, especially when you have seen about these weak learners, and you know, these weak learners became so strong nowadays that they can do almost yeah. anything. And, and I think this was also, I mean, toward that open question that you mentioned, I mean, the AI system is still not, I mean, like computers, uh, or are not I mean, the AI system are not still like a brain of people. And that's actually an interesting thing that I was also thinking about it. And this is so you may think about like for example we saw birds and then we created airplanes. Airplane can fly. Is they are not quite they got some ideas from birds, but they fly maybe much better than birds essentially nowadays. So you may think about the same thing for artificial intelligence that maybe it's not getting quite the way that we are thinking but they may find some other ways that actually thinking better than us. So that's, I think, a possibility that we got some ideas, the neurons, but I think the, in, uh, like in our, the neurons that we have it in our brain might be quite different from the uh, like uh, neural nets that we have, mm -hmm. it, but they are doing great things. So we don't know. I think that's yeah. the future. And we want to thank anyone. I mean, <laughs> like the- Thank uh, anyone in general? Yeah, I mean, like anyone that you mean, you want like uh, family oh. or other things. That... <laughs> well, I'm always grateful to my wife and my kids, and sure, um, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, so you don't want to say, no more than I can think yeah. my advisor. We were talking to him a lot, uh, talking about him a lot, and all my collaborators over the years and colleagues. 
So, uh, uh, are you talking? I mean, also more recently with Ron. Or, I mean, or Ron Rivest. Yeah, not really, but he did have a retirement party, and I saw him there. So that was, yeah, yeah. Actually, he fun. told me about it. He mentioned that actually. Yeah. <laughs> Retiring the and that was fun. That was like a reunion of all his old grad grad students and others. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, great. Well, I mean, uh, and the, finally, I think uh, any message for high school learner or anything that we missed. I mean, you want to mention? I think that's a good time to mention. Um, like advice. To yeah, high advice school students? If the high school, they, if they want to go see us, should they come see us or, or AI oh, or I ML see. or anything? Well, I think in in terms of professional in terms of a professional direction i mean my i my my advice usually is to follow your heart follow what you really love um you know i'm i'm fond of quoting joseph campbell who would say follow your bliss which means follow the thing you love follow what you find to be really meaningful and important to you and um you know think about can th- Think of think of your life as a story that you tell by living it, and you know think about what kind of hero or heroine you want to be at the center of that story. And sometimes it's helpful to think about what your what that story is going to look like looking back on it. So imagine yourself many years in the future looking back on your um, life and that story and what what you want to see at the end of that. Whether you had so, any regret or not, just mention. <laughs> well, you what want types to of things? The regret in what stage. types of things you wanted to do in life? Yeah, what types of things you want to look back on having done, both personally yeah. and professionally? So I don't know. I tend to recommend to people to follow their own hearts and do what they love. So, and any other, I mean, things that you think you want to say? I mean, we didn't discuss or. I think we oh, covered research, it off a lot. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah uh, uh, I mean, uh, thanks for your time. I remember actually you were mentioning, I mean, I had this one, we talked with the guests and I said, okay, it's like maybe one hour, but generally it goes more. And I think uh-huh. that there are discussions that we are talking and I enjoy that. I hope that, I mean, you enjoy that. Hopefully the people who are listening now, yeah. and in the future, they enjoy. Thanks for your time, essentially. Well, thank you so much <laughs> for having me. This yeah. was what, like a great research that you are doing. And I think I'm sure that you will continue. <laughs> Uh, with m- many more results in the future. Uh, always uh, good to talk to you and bye. Okay, you thank audience. you. <laughs> Thanks, bye. Bye.